and let's put our hands together and welcome to the stage, Pastor Jeremy Foster. Come on, let's give it up for Jesus right now. King of the world, let's go. Every campus, lift your voice. Isn't God good? can be seated at all of our campuses. What an honor it is to be here with each and every one of you. It's such an incredible honor um, to be with my pastor, Pastor Chris Hodges and Tammy and the family. I love uh, what God is doing in Birmingham and all of our campuses around Alabama, what he's getting ready to do in Georgia, and what he's doing around the world through your church. And uh, I'm honored to be here. If you're a guest and you've heard about Pastor Chris and everybody's like, yeah, I got to come here, Pastor Chris, I feel your collective disappointment. Um, <laughs> I am not Pastor Chris, although I did wear a jacket. Um, I don't normally wear a jacket. Um, I have this jacket for when I come to Church of the Highlands. I call it my Birmingham blazer. And so I do my best to be like PC, and uh, so I'll do a little bit of this today. I might say, come on, somebody, and every now and then I'll say, can I get a better amen? So I'm just... I'm a podcast listener as, uh, as well as the son of the house, and I'm honored to be here and grateful for each and every one of you at every campus, uh, people watching around the world. Thank you um, for what you guys do for pastors. I know you hear about it. I know you see it, but I'm, a, I'm living proof um, that you guys, you changed the trajectory of our church with the conference that's getting ready to happen this week because of your generosity, because of your faithfulness. Um, there'll be thousands of pastors in 2014. I was one of those pastors. We sat right up here in the nosebleeds. I think it's the best seats in the house, honestly, a little bit more leg room. But we sat up there, and God radically changed my life, and we launched our church with the principles um, that Pastor Chris uh, and, and Tammy and the team here authored. Our church thinks I'm the smartest guy in the world. They're like, wow, that dream team thing, that's a great idea. I'm like, I know. <laughs> I need you to start preaching again, man, because I need some sermons. Um... <laughs> He preaches it next week. I'm like, the Lord spoke this to me. I just want to, we're going to enter 21 days of prayer. <laughs> Let me get in the word, man. I'm glad to be here. We're going to be reading out of the book of Isaiah uh, chapter 40. I'm glad my wife is here. Would you give her and my family a great big hand? I love you very much, woman. And you're amazing. All right, Isaiah chapter 40. Here's the context. The children of Israel are getting ready to go into captivity. Isaiah is a prophet of God. He's also very intuitive. He knows how they think. So he, he knows how they think, so he knows what they're going to say about what they're getting ready to deal with, and he predicts it. And then he's gonna give it a shift and tell them how they should be thinking. All right, let's read. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? Here's what they're saying. My way is hidden from the Lord. You ever had that moment? You feel like not even God knows where you're at? Not even God knows what you're dealing with. So he reads that into the moment, and then he says something peculiar. He says, and you also say, my just claim is passed over by my God. Now, I think this is interesting, because he doesn't say your pointless whining is passed over by my God. They have a just claim. He recognizes you have a real issue. I'm not just trying to get you to stop thinking about the reality of your issue. He says, your claim is just. You have a problem. You ever had a problem and a struggle, something going on, and somebody acts oblivious? They act like it's nothing. Oh, brother, it'll be fine. Don't you worry about it. God will come through right on time, and you just want to slap them. Because you're like, you know, what I'm dealing with is real. So this weekend, I'm going to kind of title this talk, The Struggle is Real. Turn to your neighbor and say, The Struggle is Real. It's real. I don't want to downplay your issue. A few years ago, you know, we launched our church um, in 2015, and um, we had a youth night because we follow y'all's model. We kind of do everything that y'all do. And so we were like, oh, Highlands has a youth night? We have a youth night. Um, and so we brought our city groups together because, yeah, we have city groups too. And we have small groups. Um, we have a growth track. We have a dream team. We have freedom group. We do it all, okay? I preach the same series. Don't listen to my podcast. Just listen to his. That's, it's always smarter. I need props. He doesn't, Okay. I can't even preach with the TV because I can't remember what I, what's on it. Um, <laughs> it's the truth. I'm like, uh, oh, God, I don't know. Why. Jesus, help me. Um, so I remember, remember my, I told my daughters our first youth night, and I said, look, as many friends as you can invite, we'll bring them. And, and, and Jessie, she's sitting right down here on the front. She said, Dad, what if we bring a ton? What if we bring more than you can bring? I was like, girl, I'll rent a van. And, and they had 15 friends 
ready to come with them. And so Jennifer was like, you better rent a van. And listen, your boy don't play. I wouldn't go go rent no minivan. I'm, I need a 15 passenger econo line. I need to go for it. But I also didn't have very much money, so I needed it cheap. And so um, <laughs> that's not smart. If you ever have to rent a 15 passenger van, pay a little extra money. So I rented the cheapest van that I could find. So we had to drive like 50 miles to get this cheap van. It cost us more in gas, whatever. Anyway, um, I'm not good at math. And so we, we went to pick it up and it was taking so long that my wife was like, look, I'm gonna leave you here. I'm gonna go back with the kids. And you picked up the van, they took forever. And finally the lady was like, okay, we have your van ready, Mr. Foster. And I was like, all right. And so we go out there and she's like, like here it is. And I was like, awesome. And she opened the double doors. And when she opened the double side doors, the most putrid smell attacked my face and the holes in my face were like no and and she and literally she was like and I literally I looked at her I was like what what is that it smells like a raccoon died in here what is that smell and she said don't worry it's in the carpet I was like, that's the problem. It's in the car. It's in the metal. That, I can't bring kids to Jesus in that. That ain't a sweet-smelling savor in anybody's nostril. Holy Spirit ain't even going to be in that van. He'd be like, I'm out. I'm... The enemy is taking over that van. She looked at me. She said, well, it's all we've got. I was like, man, it ain't good enough. She was like, it's not really that big of a deal. I was like, it's a big deal. You get in there. Let me shut the door and see how you like it. She got mad at me. I forgot I was a pastor. I got mad at her. My wife wasn't there to pick me up. I was like, I'm leaving. And, and I forgot, I, I, I don't have a car. <laughs> and so after the door slammed behind me, I was like, um, okay. And so I'm walking down the road. I'm just walking down the road. My wife calls. She's like, where are you at? I'm like, I'm on 59. She's like, how long is it going to take you to get out? I was like, about seven hours. <laughs> I was so furious. Here's why. Because she acted like it wasn't a big deal when it's a big deal. Sometimes things are a big deal. The challenge is sometimes we focus so much on the pain that we can't see the promise that's inside of the pain. Sometimes at some point you have to stop focusing so much on what's in front of you and focus what's on the inside of you. Because the last time I checked, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Come on, somebody, can I get a better amen? I'm preaching good right now. <laughs> Listen, you, you have to learn to fix your focus. This is why the Bible tells us to think on good things. If there's any praise, if there's any virtue, think on good things. Here, here's why Isaiah's talking to them about their thoughts, because thought, thoughts produce words, words produce actions, actions produce habit, habits produce character, and character produces your destiny. Turn to your neighbor and say, life is hard. Life is just hard. And at some point, you got to realize that. I teach my kids all the time, hey, life is hard. It should be easier. It's hard. You remember when y'all asked for an allowance? They asked for an allowance when they were little. They were like, hey, Dad, can I have an allowance? I laughed at them. Because <laughs> I remember what my dad said when I asked my dad for an allowance. I was like, hey, Pop, everybody's got an allowance. Can I have an allowance? He was like, you already have one. I was like, what is it? He goes, I allow you to live in my house. <laughs> some of y'all never take notes. You're like, that's good right there. I'm on. First Timothy says, a, a workman is worth his wages. That means if you don't work, man, you don't get wages. Life is hard. It's a challenge. This should be easier. And the challenge for me is sometimes I believe, and I'm guilty of it, sometimes I preach the promises without the pain. But almost every promise has pain in it. Think about it. Look at this. Psalm chapter 9. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. He's a refuge and he's a stronghold, but that means I'm going to deal with oppression and I'm going to deal with trouble. Think about this one. This is one of my favorites. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. That means he's going to care, but I'm going to deal with anxiety. I'm going to deal with some depression. I'm going to deal with some issues. I'm going to deal with some overwhelming things, but he's going to be there for me. I love this one, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you. What does that mean? I'm going to need grace. No matter how good I am, no matter how starched my jeans are, shine my boots are, sharp my Birmingham blazer is, I'm going to need grace. Life is hard. Turn to your neighbor and say, marriage is hard. <laughs> Some of y'all didn't turn. You're like, no, baby, with you. It's... So he's not, that's not a man of God. 
Remember before you got married, you were like, we're so in love. It's gonna be amazing. We're gonna have the best marriage ever. Ah, I love you so much. I love you too. I love you, baby. I love you too. And then like three weeks into it, you're like, why are you alive? You know? <laughs> Parenting, hard. It's hard. Remember before you were a parent, you were like, oh, I'll never act that way to my kids. There, I will never say because I told you so. I will give my children a reason. And when they're three, you're like, because I said so. I got five kids. If they just all get to 18 alive, I'm going to call it a win. I got one of them coming to Highlands College. Come on, somebody. Thank you, Jesus, for Highlands College. It's, it's hard. Ministry is hard. Life is a challenge. The problem is we give up too soon. That's the challenge with some of us, because we don't actually progress past the pain. If you want victory, there's going to be a fight. And Isaiah, here's what I love about this. Isaiah points them not to their situation, but to the God of their situation. Listen, don't, don't, don't believe that you're going to die in your dilemma. There's something on the other side of where you are right now. Don't put a period where God put a comma. Don't build a house where God said build a tent. Where I'm going is greater than what I'm going through. And if God is all I've got, then God is all I need. And I'm going to make it. So I have, to, I have to switch my perspective. So here's what Isaiah says. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. I love this verse of scripture. Have you not known? Have you not heard the everlasting God? Huh. That's what the commas mean right there. The Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. I picture Isaiah in like a six-button suit just jamming choirs behind him right here. The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is he weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. Am I preaching good? Somebody shout me down right now. And the young men shall utterly fail. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. And if I was in an old school gospel church, I'd say, teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. Hey, yeah, yeah. Calm down. Come on. Come on now. Some of y'all don't know the old school. They that wait upon the Lord. White people, I am so proud of y'all. Y'all had such a hard time clapping in worship. Y'all picked up the two claps so quick. That was amazing. Whew, I don't even. I could be done right now. My work here is finished, Pastor Chris. I, <laughs> But I'm waiting on God. Waiting in the word looks like mounting up with eagles. It looks like running. It looks like walking. It never looks like standing still. At some point, you have to realize my waiting looks like working. I'm going to go through growth track. I'm going to get on the dream team. I'm going to serve something that's bigger than me. Nothing puts your pain, your heartache in perspective like serving something greater than yourself. Thank you for the way that you serve pastors. There are people in heaven because of your generosity, because of your kindness that you won't meet until you get over there. I got a church filled with them that we launched in 2015, and now in just four years, we've seen more than 31,000 people give their lives to Jesus because somebody rode into Birmingham years ago and showed us how to do it. It's painful. It's painful. Here's what I want you to know. God will never give you a life that makes him unnecessary. Strength is made perfect in my weakness. And it's in your weakness you realize how weak you are. It's in the moment of trying to be strong that I realize I'm not, a, I'm not what I thought I was. A few years ago, my wife decided to buy a rug. And she was like, hey, you're coming with me. I was like, oh, I'm a rug specialist. <laughs> so we went to buy the rug. And she was like, do you like this one? I was like, love it. She's like, what about this one? I was like, love it. She was like, which one? I was like, both of them. Love them both. She does the same thing with outfits. She comes out, she's like, what do you think? I'm like, baby, you're beautiful, that's amazing. She comes out with a different one. I was like, what happened to the other? You don't like this one? I was like, I don't like, I'll wear your dress. Let's just go. <laughs> I, love, I love you, babe. 
So she finally picks the rug, and when she picks the rug, we live in Houston, it's a massive international city, and these two sweet little Hispanic ladies came up to help us. They didn't speak very much English, and so we finally communicated to that one, and so they got it down, and they start rolling it up, and then a fight ensued. They started arguing over how they were going to do this, and they were arguing in Spanish, and I was raised on a ranch. I know when they're cussing, and they, they, were, they, were, they were getting after it. I mean, there was a whole lot of words like, I hate that, and there was a whole lot of stuff happening. That means, hush your mouth. And there was a whole lot of stuff happening, and, and, and literally, it felt, like, <laughs> it felt like an episode of Telemundo. Like, I, like, it wouldn't have surprised me if a mustache dude come out and says, Yo soy el hombre, señoritas, and slap somebody. I, I, <laughs> I, listen, the real preacher will be back next weekend, guys. This is my last weekend here. Let's make it fun. And, and so, like, they picked this up, they picked the carpet up, put it on their shoulders, and they were like, vamanos. And I was like, no, 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 my mama raised me better. I can't let y'all carry this. Uh, let me carry it. And they were like, you sure? And I was like, uh, yo, me, trabajo. That means work. And I was like, por favor. And they were like, okay. And that's all I got, because after that, it's like chili con queso and burrito. And those are anointed words, too, but they didn't fit the moment. And so they dropped the carpet, and then I picked up the carpet, and then I realized how weirdly strong these two little ladies were, because when I tried to pick the carpet up, I was like, <laughs> And my wife was laughing, and in the next moment, I realized my little seven-year-old, my little eight-year-old daughter are on either side of the carpet, and we're walking out, and I'm struggling. My man card's laying back there under some lady's feet. It was in the moment of trying to be strong, I realized how weak I was. Here's what I want you to know. Pain in your hands blinds you, binds you, and confines you. But pain in the hands of God does something else. Pain in the hands of God, pain produces partnership. And when I'm in pain and I get somebody else to walk through that with me, that's why in September we're relaunching all of our groups and you're gonna have the opportunity to get in a group. You ought to go to group leader training right now because somebody needs you and you need somebody because you're not designed to go through pain alone. The first thing that God said wasn't good was for man to be alone. So he made woe man and all the men said amen. Or just say woe man, either one, it's the same thing. Man, whoa, man. You're not designed to do life alone. You have to be in partnership. You got to get the right people around you. I remember we went through a hard, a hard season in our marriage. The first five years were, were challenging. We had two kids, and then we separated for 27 months. And I don't have time to tell you the story, but it, it was painful. There was no infidelity. We loved each other. We just didn't like each other. We, could, we couldn't live together. It was brutal. And I remember asking God, God, why? I'm in bivocational ministry. I'm struggling over here, and now my marriage is shot. What do I do? And I went to this old bishop at a conference, and I went to him, and I said, why am I going through this? I'm so frustrated with where I'm at. Why? And he looks at me, and he says, Jeremy. He had one of those voices, Jeremy. He said, are you closer to God than you've ever been? And I stopped, and I was like, yeah, because I gave my life to Jesus when I was five, but I didn't really need it until I was 25. And I said, yeah, I am. He said, then don't ever despise anything that drags you to the feet of the cross. And I thought, wow, I'd have never had that perspective if I hadn't had somebody to partner with me in the midst of the pain. When you get somebody to partner with you, pain produces partnership, and then partnership produces promise. Because sometimes I don't realize I have a promise until somebody tells me. Because my perspective oftentimes is just the pain. But when I've got somebody that comes alongside of me and says, hey, I know it's hard right now. I know it's tough, but you're going to get through it. I'm going to pray you through it. That's why we go into 21 days of prayer. That's why it's getting ready to happen. We're going to partner. You're going to pray. Campuses are going to pray. Campuses are going to be open. You're going to be able to pray early in the morning. And you're going to get focused. And you're going to get perspective because you're going to realize I'm not doing this by myself. I'm inviting God into my situation. I'm inviting someone else into my situation. And now I realize I won't die in my dilemma because there's something on the other side of this pain. Notice what Isaiah chapter 40 verse 29 says, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. What does this mean? You cannot do it on your own, but God has promised he'll be there if you'll let him in on it. I love Acts chapter four verse 13. Uh, Peter and, 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 and John are doing amazing things and people are freaked out by it. Here's what it says. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. The King James Version says they were ignorant and unlearned. The New Texas Version says they're ignorant. That's, that's dumber than stupid. They're ignorant. They looked at them and they went, how do you have the power? How do you? We know you 
you were kind of a nobody, and now you're doing something. You ever met somebody, and, and you, you meet them, and you're like, that's the most joyful? Man, they are so, man, what a power. We're going to talk about it next week. We're going to talk about joy and choosing joy. We're going to talk about that, and it's, it's the power of prayer that helps you produce that. You see somebody like that, and then you realize what they're going through, and it blows your mind. This is exactly what happens. They look at Peter and John and say, we don't even know how y'all are doing what you do. And then they took note that they had been with Jesus. I promise you, if you'll partner with Jesus, there's a promise on the other side of that partnership that you can hold on to no matter what your marriage is doing right now, no matter what your business is doing right now, no matter what your finances are doing right now, no matter what your hopes and your dreams are doing right now. There's something on the other side of lonely. There's something on the other side of pain. There's something on the other side of hurt. You might be in process right now, but don't get so busy looking at the process that you forget the promise. It's your partnership with God that reminds you. You gotta let God in on it. I remember my, my oldest daughter, Jaden, she's coming here to Highlands College uh, in a couple of weeks, and I remember when she was a little kid, I guess the third grade, she had a, a, a shoebox habitat project that she had to do. And some of y'all have done those before. They're infuriating. And so when she came home, she was like, I have a shoebox habitat. I was like, please, God, let her choose desert. It's like sand, A. You know what I mean? I was like, well, what'd you choose? She said, I chose frozen tundra. I was like, of course you would choose frozen tundra. We in Houston, that's awesome. We've never seen snow. And she, she looked at me and she said, Daddy, can you help me? And all of a sudden, all my frustration went, yes, I can. And we boldly went to Hobby Lobby. <laughs> and $65 later, I didn't do a shoe box. Your boy did a boot box. We built this thing. It had paper mache. It had the water. It had a glacier. We bought little plastic animals. I cut a seal in half. He's coming up out of the water. It was amazing. Like Discovery Channel would be like, bro, that's good. And then she said, Daddy, can you help me carry it into school? And I was like, I would, it would be my honor. So we parked, and she's carrying it into school, and I'm walking beside her, and I see other little children holding their little shoeboxes with leaves in it, looking at hers, like, ah, ah, crying. She's like, my daddy's better than your daddy. Man, like we, we went in the classroom, and all the kids abandoned their shoeboxes, and they came over, and they were ooing and aahing and freaking out, and she didn't even pay attention to them. She turned, and she looked at me, and she threw her arms around me, and she said, you're the best daddy in the world, and here's what I want you to know. She never asked me to go over and beyond. She never asked me to spend the money. All she said was, daddy, can you help me? And here's what my Bible says. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heaven Father, come to your rescue. But you got to ask him. You got to partner with God. And finally, once you realize there's a promise, promise produces power. Let me show you something real quick. This little example up here, I, I kind of, I want you to understand this. This, in case you don't know, this is a, it's a, it's a lever. In Texas, we call it a lever. It's a lever. It's one of the oldest inventions. It's got three parts. It's got the load, it's got the arm, and then it's got the fulcrum. And the fulcrum gives us leverage to move something that we cannot move. There's two ends to the arm. There's the load end, and there's the effort end. And I'm going to show you the power of God in this simple illustration. In my life, without a fulcrum, with a whole bunch of effort, I can't move that. But when I slide God into my situation, he gives me leverage that I would not have on my own. It still takes some effort. It still takes some pushing. It still takes some elbow grease. My daddy used to always say, you got to push. You got to pray until something happens. That's what we're going to do in 21 days. We're going to get God in on our situation. And you know this. We know this. If you've been coming to church at all, you know this. I got to get God in on it. But here's the problem. A lot of us, we invite God in, but we just invite him in a little bit. Like, I can handle it. I'm good. How you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. He don't answer email. He answers an email. Come on, somebody. <laughs> How you doing? Fine. I'm doing fine. Where are you going to eat? Fine. I'm fine. And we're over here 
We're letting God just in on a little bit of it. And he's going, hey, would you let me have that? Would you, would you let me help you with your marriage? Would, would, would you let me help you with your finance? Would, would you let me help you with your drink? We, we, we've got all kind of stuff set up to help you move forward. We want you to move from one stage to the next. That's why we got growth track. You got to go to growth track. We got the dream team. You got to get on the dream team. You got to get in groups, be a part of 21 days. All of that is not designed for us as a church to go, look at how many groups we have. Oh, hallelujah. It's to say, look at what God is doing through people, empowering people to get God close to their situation but over here see here's what happens we compartmentalize our life and God and here's what I want you to know the closer you get him to the issue and the situation the more power and authority he has to speak over what is coming against you and you then have the power to move what is in your life that's coming against you right there's where you ought to clap your hands to God because he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think but you got to let him in on it I want to read you a letter I got a couple of years ago somebody who understood pain she sent me this letter. She said, my mother was a single mom. Life wasn't easy growing up, but we loved one another dearly. She worked like a dog with only an eighth grade education to support four little girls and never got any child support. I knew she loved me, but there were always habits and addictions lurking in her life that continually knocked her off course. At the age of 11, my world fell apart. My mother divorced her third husband. I was heartbroken and devastated because he was the only man that I'd ever called daddy. My biological father had abandoned us when I was little and now another daddy was leaving. Our lives spun wildly out of control as my mother fell deeper into addiction. My normal wasn't normal at all. We moved from Texas to Oklahoma and it was a life altering move. We were closer to my grandmother and she began taking me to her church. I'd never felt anything like this. I remember walking down that long aisle and kneeling at the front and giving my heart to Jesus. It was a profound moment of realization in my life that there really was a love that wouldn't leave and that's the moment God truly became my father. I didn't realize how much I would need that protecting and loving hand of my new father. I lived through verbal, mental, physical and emotional abuse constantly. Somehow my conversion to Christ had caused my mother to feel guilty. It was hard for her to take that I had found a real love and the abuse got worse. My mother married again, and in that marriage, we became a blended family and acquired two stepbrothers. The marriage didn't last long, but during that time, I was able to lead my two stepbrothers to Christ. Mother got hooked on prescription drugs and became very abusive. I knew what it was for my own mother to pull out a loaded 45 and hold it against my temple and scream, I'm gonna blow your brains out. It was the drugs talking. I knew she loved me, but it was a horrible thing for an eighth grader to go through. I remember running next door and I shook as the neighbors called the police and a judge committed my mom to a state mental hospital for six months. My three sisters and I lived with our grandmother and that was some of the greatest moments of my childhood because she took us to her church. When mama got out of the institution, we went home with her, but she was angry and bitter and slipped right back into the drug habit. There were different men coming in and out of our home every week. She quickly divorced husbands five and six and continued to live a lifestyle of drugs and abuse. She would grab me by the hair of the head and knock me into the door facings and sling me into the coffee table screaming and cursing. I struggled not to believe the things she would say about me. Spankings were beatings. She'd get backhand you quicker than you could blink. But through it all, I knew God had a purpose for my life. I was so desperate for God I would ride to church with anybody who would take me. Oftentimes riding in the back of a pickup truck for 60 miles round trip just to get into the presence of God. Mama got worse. I remember her storming into the church one morning and screaming for us to get up and get out of there. And I finally threw up my hands and I told her, that's it, I'm quitting church. She stopped, her eyes cleared up and in a soft voice she said, please, please don't quit going to church. I'm miserable and you can't turn out like me. After I graduated from high school, my mother married husband seven, eight, and nine. But my life has taken a different path. And when I walked into Hope City for the first time, I felt that same presence of God that I felt as an 11-year-old girl desperate for love and acceptance. Thank you for providing a place where people can find healing, hope, and happiness. My story has a happy ending. A year and a half before my mama died with tears in her eyes, I was able to lead her to Christ. And I thank God every day for churches like Hope City who reach hurting people. It was because of a church like this that an 11 year old girl gave her heart to Christ and I've never looked back. And 
here's why that letter hits me so hard. Because that was my mama who wrote it. <laughs> and that was my grandma who put her through hell. And I don't know who the man was who drove his truck. 30 miles to pick her up, 30 miles to take her to church, 30 miles, 30 miles, 120 miles round trip. The man never stood on a stage. I don't know if he ever led a small group, but I know he gave what he had, and what he had was a truck. And I'm grateful for people who go all in because some man with a truck and the determination of my mama, here I am standing here today telling you God is faithful if you let him in on it he won't bully his way in but when you invite him in she was 11 years old they've been married 48 years in ministry all these years she could have never known as an 11 year old that her son one day would grow up to be a preacher and then in our church in four years, we'd see 31,000 people give their lives to Jesus. All because of determination to let God in. Will you let God in today? Will you just let him in? Let him into the pain. And then you'll find out there's a promise. And when you rely on that promise, that's power. And it's available for you at every campus today. Would you bow your heads every campus? Close your eyes. I want to pray for you. Before I do that, I want to ask you a question. It's a real simple question. If you know that you've held him out, for some reason or another, it might have been intentional. Maybe you just didn't want him to know that you were dealing with all of that, or maybe you didn't think he could help, or maybe you didn't know he could help. He's standing at the door and knocking. You've been praying for an open door, and I would tell you, the door is already open. He's waiting on you. But if you know you need to put Jesus at the center of your life. You know, somewhere in my life, I've just held him out. I don't want anybody looking around, but here's the gospel. The gospel is this. You were born in sin. You were shaped in iniquity, and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. But you have to acknowledge him. The Bible says when you acknowledge him, he will acknowledge you. That is a promise with power. So no matter what pain you're in right now, if you know at every campus, I need to acknowledge him. I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I just want you to pop your hand up boldly. Nobody looking around. One, two, three. Bang. Hands all over the room. Oh, thank you, God, for the response. Can we every voice pray something like this? Jesus, I trust you with my life. I cannot do this by myself. I've held on for as long as I can hold on, and I need you now. I trust you with all of my pain, with all of my heartache and my sins. I ask for your forgiveness. I need you in my life. And so I'm turning my life over to you right now. I'm asking you, Jesus, to be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give him an ovation of worship. God, you did.